Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Tony Perez. For those that don't know who I am or what I do, I go by PerezBox online. You can find me at PerezBox.com, PerezBox on Twitter, PerezBox on Facebook, PerezBox on LinkedIn. I think you get, kind of get the trend there. Um, I'm uh, the VP of Product Management over at the GoDaddy Security Business Unit. It's a brand new business unit that's responsible for security for website owners specifically. Um, it's a recent organization that was stood up uh, during the acquisition of Security, which is one of the company that I co-founded and I was previously the CEO at. Uh, a lot of the information that I'm going to be sharing today is based on my experience working in the website security domain uh, for a little bit over the past six, six and a half years, working with thousands and thousands of business owners, everywhere from the smallest blog owner uh, to the largest of organizations, um, from folks using WordPress, folks using Drupal, folks using .NET applications, it doesn't really matter. So uh, I'll be basing a lot of my opinions on that, uh, and, and I'll be pushing some of my own ideology. And you can walk away and be like, that guy's crazy, and that's all right. You know what I mean? I respect that. So for those that don't uh, know what Sukuri is, Sukuri is a security platform that we developed uh, about seven years ago uh, designed to provide a suite of tools to website owners. And we, we focus around three core areas around protecting websites from external attacks, uh, detecting issues, um, and uh, providing incident response in the event of a compromise. That being said, um, we're not really going to talk much about that. And in fact, I'm going to contradict myself a little bit. We built a solution for website owners to help with their security posture, but in reality, our product isn't for everyone. And we realized that um, along this way. And the reason it isn't for everyone is because I think as website owners, we, we kind of think of security in the wrong way. We try to fit it into this, this same box when it, it really isn't. We can't approach it the way we do everything else. And we, we normally approach it from a technological perspective. What technology, what configurations, what solutions do I need to be deploying? But the fact is that in many instances, we're not really prepared for that. We're not really prepared to deploy the right technology because we're not really asking the right questions. And so we'll deploy a solution, which we have, we'll have organizations purchase our product, uh, and they'll go six months without configuring. And then they'll get compromised and like, oh my God, but I bought this product. And I was like, well, why did you buy the product? What were you trying to mitigate? What were you trying to achieve? And in many instances, they don't know. There's a lot of bureaucracy, there's all these organizations trying to, com nobody knows who to communicate, who's the real owner when it comes to security. You talk to the security guy and the security guy goes, fuck that shit, I don't want anything to do with that. Right, that, that's PHP based, I don't want that, that's not going to my network, that belongs to the marketing group. Marketing group says, but I'm just a marketer. I just want to push my content out, right? Um, and then some, a compromise happens, the brand gets affected, and then everybody gets involved. Then the executives get involved, and they're like, hey, who's responsible for this? And then the security guys come into place, like, oh, we're going to lock it all down, right? Um, but unfortunately, we're just not having the right conversation. And so I want to kind of change that dialogue a little bit. So instead of sitting here and telling you all the various configuration changes you need to be doing, all the, the articles you should be reading around uh, blocking certain things, um, I want to take it up a level and talk about security a little bit more holistically, right? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about principles, things that I believe we should all be thinking about, and, and mindsets that we should be deploying when we're thinking either about uh, processes we want to implement or um, any controls we want to deploy within our stack. And hopefully, kind of, we set the same uh, tone uh, across the entire discussion. The very first thing I always like to start with is that security is not a static state, yet we always treat it that way. Oh, what are today's threats? Oh, what, what, what are we talking about today? We're talking about DDoS. Oh my God, DIN got taken down. Ah, Twitter was down, right? Holy shit, I gotta prepare for DDoS. Listen, when was the last time you got DDoS? I, I don't even know what DDoS is. So why are you so concerned about it? Oh, because I, I just read it on TechCrunch and I, I gotta be worrying about that. I'm like, oh, okay, well, sounds good. Let's, let's plan for that. I got a solution for that. Right? And that's traditionally how vendors will take it. You go to the latest RSA, last year it was identity access management. This year, everybody does DDoS. And I'm like, what? how is this even possible? How is it that last year you were a professional and expert in identity access management, and then this year you know everything about DDoS? I, I don't understand how that's going on. But then as, as business owners, we go in and we're like, okay, well, these are the latest things that I'm hearing about. This is what we need to deploy. We need to kind of change that mindset and we need to understand security is always going to evolve. And it has for many, many years. And if we're always thinking about what's happening today, we're always going to be two steps behind, right? Because the attackers are that much further ahead. Of course, in security, we have this big challenge. This is the biggest challenge that I have when I talk to organizations is that we're not a revenue generating function, right? Nobody really likes to talk about security until they have to talk about security. You go to your executives like, oh, we need to invest in security. How much you need? Oh, I need a million dollars. Yeah, I'll give you 50,000. Awesome. And then you get hacked. How do we get hacked? 
Well, we don't have the resources, we don't have the people, we don't have the knowledge, we don't have all this stuff. Why do we have all this stuff? Well, because we don't make any money. Well, we need to fix that. Okay, next quarter comes around, you're no longer focusing on it anymore because now it's out of sight, out of mind, right? Your availability wasn't affected anymore. You're not distributing malware anymore, right? Um, and so it's a very difficult conversation that we have. This is compounded by the issue that the threats are growing at an exponential rate relative to the knowledge and resources that we have available to us. Right? The people that actually understand what security is about and what we need to be thinking about and how we need to be communicated is a lot less than the, the growth at which these platforms are going online. If you think about how the open source applications have dramatically infected the internet ecosystem, right? look at the WordPresses, the Drupals, the Joomla's. They have facilitated a new type of website owner, a new website owner that doesn't understand the nuances of IT security or, secure, or IT in general. Most of them, where do you host? I host on Google. How do I even begin that conversation? <laughs> like, like, I don't think Google hosts your site, right? Uh, and so that is an example of the challenge that we have. And so as a community, we have to come together and we need to start having better conversations. It's not about us coming up here and telling people what they need to be configuring. It's about us educating them on the concepts and the principles around security. We have to understand that it's all about timing and resources and motivation, and the attackers have all of that, especially today. Today, there's an elaborate supply chain available to attackers. People can go on the dark web, sell their solutions, sell their exploit kits, get it up online, and they can make money really fast, right? With the explosion of online applications, such as Drupal and WordPress and Joomla and all these open source solutions, we've created this new ecosystem that allows attackers to more easily exploit environments. Look at what happened with the DNC hack. What do we learn from the DNC hack? Well, it wasn't an elaborate attack. It was exploitation of everyday websites that many of you will use that were being used maliciously to fish into the network. There's nothing fancy about that. Like, I wish I could come up here and be like, oh, look at this crazy thing. Like, no, it was a little WordPress site that got exploited and they were being serving up phishing attacks. And, you know, phishing is the number, way, number one way to get into environments these days. And so our websites are a critical piece to a much larger internet ecosystem with much more drastic impacts around the world, and we're seeing that every day. And so, the way I look at it, it's not about presenting new concepts, but rather just about expanding our existing approach to security, right? Um, what does it really entail? And the first thing I was, second thing I always like to introduce is kind of, security is, while technology is a critical piece of security, it's really about the people, the process, and the technologies, right? The technology by itself is dumb. I told you a story a minute ago about organizations that come deploy our solution and then they still get compromised. About 40% of our customers never configure the product. Why is that? Why do they go, they buy it, and then once the minute they buy, they feel that they've got the solution that they required? Did it check all the marks in their checklist? Oh, it does DDoS mitigation. Oh, it provides incident response, right? They're forgetting that without the people in the process, the technology is usually pretty dumb. You buy a firewall, you deploy it, but you don't configure it, and you allow, allow all, that's awesome. You know what I mean? You have a really expensive pass-through, right? The people go in and they identify, what am I trying to mitigate? What am I trying to understand? What is my website about? And so we have to work together to try to bridge that divide. We have to bridge the divide between the knowledge that we have and the knowledge that the environment in which we work with has. And in many instances, there's a very, very big divide. So as we're talking about it, I always, I, I'm a big believer in a layered approach to security, right? Um, many of you will know it as defense in depth. It's always, it's always synonymous with onions because um, of the multiple layers, right? And the idea is that they're complementary layers that work together to ensure that um, if something fails, we're prepared in some way or shape. There's never one single solution that will prevent us from being that, um, uh, compromise. We should always assume that at some point we will be compromised. It's not about a number of when, but it's if. It's not about if, it's when. And uh, when I talk about defense in depth, I was doing some research on this and kind of figuring out how far back it goes. And in fact, it goes all the way back to 1295 uh, in the original designs of castles. And what's really interesting and why I like this illustration is because you can see how the architects were thinking about protecting their castles, right? Um, what you don't see is Outside of the moat, what they would do is that they would actually clear all the trees for about 100, 200 yards so they can see any, any enemy advancing. 
they would then create a moat, and they would only have one access point down here at the bottom. And that access point would be where everybody comes in. And so you would have to pass the clearing. You would have all the towers shooting arrows at you, right? Uh, you would have to cross the moat that was deep, and then you would only have one access point. If you reach the outer wall, that was backed up by an inner wall. So you would get over the outer wall, you would be in that inner, middle area there, that, and then you would have an outer wall that's even higher than the uh, than inner wall that's even higher than the outer wall and thicker. So if they break down one, they have another layer. And then they would have defensive positions within the castle itself. Right? This is how they thought about physically protecting their castles. And the last thing you don't see in here either is outside of the clearing is that the, um, the castle would actually be raised as well. So the land around it would be at one level and the castle would be raised. So not only would they have to cross the moat, but they would have to climb additionally. That's a really, really interesting thing. And what I would challenge you to do is I would challenge you to go back and think about your security posture and what are the layers that you're deploying. And when you're doing that, don't just think about defense and depth, which is what you traditionally hear, but think about defense and depth and defense and breadth. What does your entire attack surface look like? In many instances when we talk about website security, we stop at the application. But the attack surface is that much more greater. You have your local environment, your desktops. How many of you actually look at that? You have the application, of course, the things we have to do with the configuration there. You have the server, the infrastructure, the people aspect of it. And I'll be spending a lot more time on the people as we move forward. But in the server and infrastructure, we, we, we were briefly joking about this on GoDaddy Security, right? But who's the responsible person for your server? Do you have a shared account? Do you have a VPS? Have you had a dialogue with your server or whoever manages your server, whether that's an internal property, whether that's a host? Do you truly understand who's responsible in the event of an incident? And do you understand the differences in incidents, the difference between network-based incidents versus an application-based incident versus an account incident? And are you prepared to respond to it in the event that there's an issue? You should be asking yourself these questions and going back to your organizations and asking them and saying, hey, what do I have for the various layers of security? And what are the controls that we've deployed to address them if they ever come up? We're going to go through a little bit of an exercise, and I'm going to talk about the top five threats as I perceive them. And I may be wrong. This is not an argument. These are my beliefs. <laughs> right? So weak credentials, of course. A lot of us, you know, we use bad, bad, um, bad username and password combinations, exploitation of software vulnerabilities, poorly configured environments, uh, third-party integrations, and site availability. Those are the kind of the top five things that um, I see and that we see and that we believe to be the challenges, whether you're a small organization or a large organization. Right? It doesn't really matter. And I, and I really hope that a lot of these aren't new. These should be uh, common to you. But what I'm going to talk to specifically is, is what we call the human factor. Right? How do we as humans fit into each of those layers or into each of those threats? And when I talk about the human factor, I'm referring to what I call layer eight or the weakest link. This is the OSI model in case no one uh, is familiar. And in many instances when we think about security, we're deploying security at any one of these layers, right? Either at the application or the presentation or the session layer, whatever. Whatever it may be, we're thinking of it in those terms. But why aren't we thinking about the people aspect? Why aren't we talking about the human factor associated with each one of those layers? For instance, let's look at weak credentials. What's the real problem about weak credentials? Is it that we're getting brute forced? Or is it that we're using weak credentials? Bad passwords. We're creatures of habits. We have bad behavioral problems. We use the same credentials across all our systems. I bet you many of you in here have multiple accounts, and you have this one password, you're like, ah, it don't ever happen to me. I, I use it on social. I use it on my Wells Fargo account. I use it on my Drupal account. I use it on my GitHub account. That's OK, because it'll never happen to me. That's just our habit. It's what we do. We don't update our passwords. There'll be a major leak. That's ah, OK. That's an old password anyways. Little did you know that you just had that one variation. I added that asterisk two years ago, so I'm good now. <laughs> Same thing with vulnerabilities. We don't update for a variety of reasons. Maybe our organizations don't allow us. Maybe our change control processes are too stringent. Right? Maybe we just don't know that there's an update available. We got too much shit going on. Poorly configured environment. This happens to a lot of integrators and designers and developers. You stand something up really quick. Oh, I'm just going to stand it up to test something. I'll come back and delete that later. 
You deploy it, you configure it in production, and you forget about it. This happens in smaller organizations, not so much in large organizations where they have stringent control processes. Right? But we still have a habit, even in the large production environments, where we'll leave modules or extensions or plugins in our environment that we just forget about. We never use it anymore, but we never go back to this continuous process to figure out, should we remove this? Is it still applicable? How many people log into their application and says, what are these modules I have? <laughs> like, has nobody cleaned this up? Who's responsible for this? Third-party integrations. Who actually knows what libraries they're using if they're coming from authoritative sources? How much attrition do organizations have? Who's keeping track of that? Or do we use our sites to serve up ads? Have we ever had a conversation around malvertising and the threats that that introduces? In many instances, the answer is no. Site availability. Does this really matter to you? Do you need to have your site up all the time? Do you not? What are the impacts if the site goes down? And what have you done to, to, to plan for that? I have this little thing, right? Attackers are not successful because we're technically incapable, but because we're behaviorally weak as humans. When you really think about it. And we don't spend enough time talking about it internally, amongst ourselves, or even presenting and talking about it with groups. Everybody can go online and find the top eight, ten things that we should be doing. Everybody can go online and figure out what are the top 15 modules that I should deploy for security. And we check those boxes off. And in many instances, we place all our energy on the protective side. The problem is that it doesn't fit the ideology of the defense in depth. The ideology is that there is no single solution that will ever ensure 100% protection. Once we accept this ideology and we realize that, it's an okay thing. <laughs> it's not like, I can't believe you just said I might get hacked. It's just the reality in which we live in. We have to remember that as defenders, we have to win every time. And in case you guys are wondering, anyone who watches Game of Thrones, just a quick aside, you know when Jon Snow's like standing there, and all the horses are running at him in the last season? That was the motivation for this image, right? Um, just going to want to share that. But anyways, the idea is that we have to be right every single time. And the problem is that there's a lot, more, it's like standing in front of a fire hose, and you're getting just, and you're trying not to get wet. And so we have to kind of change this dialogue a little bit. Um, we have to start looking beyond just a protective layer, and we still have to start looking at it a little bit more completely, start looking at, okay, we ha we've invested in our protective layers, but how are we continuously monitoring our environments? How do we understand if we do have a problem? How do we know what the indicators of a potential compromise are? As humans, we are our best solutions. So you may configure your solution to identify if somebody is logging in, or to, to log when somebody logs in. So now I have a log if everybody logs in. But does the system know if it's right or wrong? In many instances, you as the website owner do. If you're in LA and somebody's logging in from Shanghai, is that good or bad? You have to dictate that as a business unit. And then the question becomes, is why can Shanghai log in anyways if they're not part of your organization? Those are the ways we need to be thinking about it. In fact, in the enterprise world, um, Gartner came out with an estimate that about 60% of organizations will be switching their focus from protection to detection and response. What that means for us in this industry is that it'll probably be another five, 10 years before we start thinking about it, <laughs> right? Because we're, that's kind of like our cycle. Like whatever the enterprise does, we'll start doing, you know, five, 10 years later and be like, I can't believe this is happening. This has never happened to anybody, but in reality, it is happening. And so we have to try to curve that divide a little bit with the enterprise and say, what are they doing and why are they doing it? And doesn't it apply at this level? And how can we deploy it at this level? So we've talked about the knowledge gap, right? Um, failure to employ basic security principles. We've talked about the human factor, uh, failure to account for the biggest vulnerabilities, um, and then the investments, the improper balance of that. And so what can we do, right? And so the easiest way I like to think about it is we need to employ this, 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 this approach of security by default in almost everything we do. And this is more of a mindset, right? More than a configuration change. But I will present it to you in a, in a, from a technology standpoint to hopefully try to uh, provide you a better analogy of what I'm talking about. And in case you're wondering, I have an hour, right? So we got time. <laughs> so um, let's think about access control for a moment, right? Um, let's think about 
how we traditionally do this. And in many conversations we have, even here on the show floor, when we talk about access control, we say, hey, well, what are you doing? I said, well, you know, how can I get the latest list of blacklists? How can I get the latest list of IPs that I can blacklist and apply it? How can I get the latest list of bad bots? And I'm like, latest list as of when? Right now? How about right now? How about right now? How about, how about right now? Right? And the idea there is to show it's continuously changing. And how are you accounting for that? Every time you deploy something, by the time it goes production, it's already out of date. Okay? And so instead of taking this blacklist approach where we have to invest all this energy to identify and parse through all the IPs, does it match my IP, and then pass it through, and then you have this opportunity of false negatives like, oh, shit, that was a bad IP. Oh, let me put it back into my cycle. And then you have all these resources going through this process. Why are we really not taking a whitelist approach? Why are we just blocking everybody and allowing the known goods? In many instances, we're doing it not because we can't, it's because it's inconvenient for a lot of folks. Oh, you don't understand how this functional unit is. I, I, I can't introduce a new process for them to click a link to whitelist their IP. It's, just, it's impossible. You don't understand. They're old dogs. Can't, treat, can't teach them new tricks. That's generally the conversation. The same thing applies for passwords. Why are people still creating their own unique passwords? With the plethora of password managers in the market right now. And everybody supports it for the most part, except for banks, because banks are ridiculous, and I don't want to get into that conversation. But why is it that they're not using password managers? No one should know their password. I, I, I don't even know what else to say about that. But the same thing applies to this. But now we start seeing the secure by default mindset, where it's like, hey, explicitly block everybody and allow only the ones you know. And it's not that difficult to set up a VPN. It's not that difficult to set up a SOX proxy. It's not that difficult to educate. We had an organization of 110 people, 40 of them marketers and salespeople and administrators, and we taught them remotely, right? People are intelligent. We just have to take the time and invest it in educating them. And what happens when we do this? Well, we reduce the threats, the threat landscape. Now I'm no longer worrying about all the attacks coming in. I'm just worrying about the known goods. Who, 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 who whitelisted? Were they traveling? Were they not? Versus trying to account for everyone. Software vulnerabilities, right? The, the, the common theme we always hear about in almost every security talk is update, update, update. And then you're sitting there like, dude, you have no idea how hard it is to update. You don't know what I have to go through. I have to write a five-page justification. It has to go to this change board. The change board has to ask me 150 questions why we're still using this application, and I still haven't got to the update process. And a small business is, I didn't even know there was an update to make. Right? That is the reality. So while it's really easy for us to go back and say, hey, you should update, it's actually really hard to implement that. And so what I anticipate is that as we continue to move forward, cloud-based technologies are what's going to facilitate that. Technologies loud, like virtual patching, virtual hardening, is the direction we're going to go. Why? Because it removes that process. We no longer have to worry about what's going out. They're already existing. We no longer have to worry about going through the process of updating our production environment because now I have three, six months to do that because our virtual patching technology is addressing that for us. And so when we look at how that applies, we're employing the secure by default approach, and it is, if we apply this mindset, you'll find that you can apply that everywhere. It's not just how you IP uh, whitelist your access control, but it's how you access and, and, and function within um, your servers. Basic concepts like functional isolation fall into this world. The idea that everything does what they're supposed to do, but nothing more. Concepts like least privileged. Give people access for only the things that they require for the time that they require it and only that time. Basic principles that fall under the secure by default mindset. And if we start thinking like that, we'll immediately start seeing like, man, why do I have all these processes in place? By implementing this one thing, I can address 15 processes. I can reduce resources. I can reduce overhead. I can reduce cost. We have to remember that security is a complex thing. Right? We can't think of it from a checklist perspective. Unfortunately, when we look at things like FISMOS and um, um, FERPA and, and PCI and HIPAA, they approach it from a checklist mentality. 
or they approach it from a checklist perspective. They're not saying, though, to employ a checklist mentality. They're simply providing you a guide to complement your security posture. But as organizations, we deploy it from a checklist pers mi mindset. Like, oh, whoa, ch 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 I bought a firewall. I didn't configure it, but I bought it. Check. I'm PCI qualified. <laughs> so let's not do that. Let's leverage checklists. Let's make them part of the process to help guide us because it's a very complex environment, but we cannot think of security that way. In this process, what we need to start doing is we need to start prioritizing. This is a common theme. If you talk to any of my team members, they'll be like, they, they hate my Tony-isms, right? And they're like, oh, I have 150 ideas. I'm like, if everything's important, then nothing's important. They're like, I hate you, <laughs> right? But it's the same exact thing. Oh, we need to deploy for DDoS. We need to deploy for vulnerabilities. We need to deploy for this. If everything's important, nothing's important. Focus on one thing, finish that, move on to the next, right? What is the most important thing for your organization? And so when we, the ability to do that, a, a simple way to approach this is through risk management. And what's interesting is that security has always been about risk management, right? But specifically about risk reduction, not risk elimination. Again, it's not about us never getting hacked. It's about when we get hacked, are we prepared for that? Risk management specifically is about identifying what the issues may be, assessing what the impact of those issues may be, and then putting together a response for those issues. Is it a valid issue or is it not? When we think about it, we want to think about three specific things. We want to kind of clearly define what our scope is, right? What are we really concerned about? Um, we want to understand that it will never be zero, so it's okay to be, you know, to have some risk. Um, and we have to remember that it's a continuous process. And if we keep these three things in mind, we can kind of go through a little bit of a thought exercise. And so that's exactly what we're going to do. Let's think about a brochure site for a second, right? Um, Perez Box, for instance. Perez Box is maybe a nice little brochure site. I, I, I throw out some of my ramblings on random stuff on security and business. Um, you know, maybe for me, it's a branding issue. Maybe, you know, my biggest risk is getting blacklisted by Google. I don't want to get blacklisted by Google. I don't make any money on it but it'll look really freaking bad if my site on security gets blacklisted by Google, right? So maybe I need to look at that. Maybe I need to implement some solution that tells me, how does Google see my site? Am I distributing any malware, right? That's gonna be how I approach the risk perspective. Maybe we're a social platform. Uh, maybe to be successful as a social platform, you can never go down. Can you imagine you have a social platform and it's down 15 minutes every other hour? That'd be kind of sad, right? So maybe availability is more important than anything else. Maybe we're a health application. Shit, now we start getting into this world, we gotta worry about things like HIPAA. We're storing sensitive information, right? We got that kind of stuff. I don't give a shit if my site goes down, I just can't get my information stolen, right? And if it gets stolen, they can't do anything with it. So I can't just be talking about encrypting shit in transit, I gotta be thinking about encrypting stuff at rest, right? Oh, the big mama, e-commerce, right? We got all kinds of problems going on there, right? Our risk posture just increased dramatically. In this process, we need to be thinking about our goals. What do we, what do we want to achieve? Our goals tell us what we're trying to mitigate against, right? Um, I don't want people to intercept my sensitive information if I got an e-commerce site. So what am I going to do to achieve that? How am I going to address exploitation of vulnerabilities? I don't want to get hacked, and I know exploitation of vulnerabilities is a big thing, so how am I going to do that? How am I going to protect my brand reputation? Right? Those goals will help us, okay, well, how am I moving towards that direction? Now, what you notice is I'm not talking to you about every other threat out there. You open up OWASP Top 10, you've got 257, 267 different threats of vulnerability potentials out there. I, I can't worry about all those things. I'm worried about the specific things that are pertinent to me as an organization. I'm not saying that they're not important, but again, if everything's important, then nothing's important. Let's take a practical approach to security. Um, instead of focusing on every possible scenario, uh, we'll look at the things that are most important to us as an organization. An interesting way to do this is, uh, I was doing some research, and I always hate presenting new concepts. I like to leverage existing concepts. And uh, the National Institute of Standards Technology came out with a framework for improving critical infrastructure and cybersecurity. What's interesting in it is that they made it very simple. Because uh, infrastructure, uh, critical infrastructure is so complex and it's so dated that they had no choice but to go simple. So when you read it, it's like, holy crap, it's so simple, it works for everyday website owners. 
That's amazing. And this is what it looks like. There's a bunch of pages in this document, and this is what it boils down to right here, right? There's five core functions that you need to be thinking about. There's a number of categories, and guess what? You can define what your own categories are within each of those functions, and then a series of sub subcategories within each. Then, if there's any informative re references, like HIPAA, or FISMA, or FERPA, or any other acronym you want to throw in there, some resources that you want to be referencing, you add it in there. And what's great is, this is a very, very simple framework that you can do for every site before you go live. And it starts to address all the pieces that we just discussed. So let, let's kind of go through that process. Let's talk about the identification um, function. Let's assume that our category is asset inventory management, the one thing that we all fail at, right? Because most of us don't know how many domains we have, let alone how many modules we have, let alone how many integrations we've done, right? So let's start there. How many web properties do you have? Who, where is your web server? If, if you got hit by a bus today, would somebody actually know where you're hosting? We laugh because we realize how fucked up a situation it is. <laughs> and we go through this process and we identify these things. Protection. What the hell are we protecting? Our application. Awesome, you protected your application. Good for you. Did you protect your server? Whoa. Well, I, I got to protect my server too, right? By having this conversation on the identification phase, we now understand what we need to be protecting. What are we monitoring? What do we care about? Are we caring about who's logging in? Are we caring about bots that are scanning our sites? Are we caring about, uh, are we being blacklisted? We don't even know. So by identifying the things that we care about, we now understand what process we need to implement and what solutions we need to look at to help us achieve that. Response, again, assuming that it'll always happen someday, what will you do? If you got hacked right now, who do you talk to? Many of you won't have an answer to that. What you'll do is like, oh my God, oh my God, what do I do? What does Google tell me? You go to your trusted advisor, right? Identify the top 10 organic ranks, maybe click a couple ads. Somebody's going to fix this for me, right? But if we take a moment to step back and think about it, and we have a plan in place, if I get hacked, okay, I'm going to go to Pantheon. They told me they're going to take care of this for me. Or I'm going to go to Black Mesh. I'm going to go whoever it is that you're hosting with. Or... I'm going to go rip my developer a new one. But you know what? Just having that name on there makes you feel good. Like, I'm going to hold that little dude accountable. Right? But at least somebody else, if you ever get hit by a bus, knows how to account for that. Recovery plan. Of course, we have to be in a constant state of learning. So what are we going to do once it's done? Psh, I never want to deal with that again. And move on? Or what, did, what happened? Where did we go wrong? Was there a risk that we didn't account for? Do we need to add that into our cycle? Do we need a better plan? Right? So it's not a matter of just mitigating the risk, but then it's about pushing it back into your cycle so that you're prepared for it in the future. You know how much it sucks to get hacked by the same thing every other month? That's just annoying. <laughs> and when it's all done, you have this nice little matrix. And there's no, there's no restriction on the number of categories or the number of subcategories that you might have. Right? That's on you as an organization to define. But I would encourage you to restrict the functions. Don't move beyond that because it's too easy to get compliance involved. It's too easy to get the security group and they get crazy. Like, oh, we got to add this too. Oh, that's too simple. Right? We love to complicate things. But in reality, um, being more simple is, is in our interest. And then you just put this in a nice little matrix. And you can start very high and go more granularly as you go through. What does it look like for your entire web ecosystem? And then what does it look like for each of the domains, right? Some people only manage a few domains, so it's not that difficult. Some people that have a large organization might take a little bit more time, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an investment worth going through. And then it's a, it's a continuous process. It's not one, again, it's not a checklist. You don't just do this and be like, whoo-hoo, never got to touch this again. No, you should be going through this process on a constant basis. Put up a little plan. Does it hurt to just open a security document once a quarter? Is it still valid? Yes. Woohoo. Right? Are my risks still the same? Well, I went from a brochure site to an e-commerce site. I might want to reevaluate my security posture, right? So what does it all look like? All this stuff I just threw at you guys, right? All this noise. My goodness. Um, use a sensible framework. Don't get caught up in all this, uh, all this noise you hear about complexity, right? You've got to do all these crazy things. No, something as simple as what we just discussed in the past 40 minutes. 
Uh, create an inventory. For the love of Christ, I hate talking to organizations that don't even know what they have. How many organizations? Ah, I don't know. I must have 1,000 or 2,000. Nobody knows that? And then you do research and they add 100. Like, or it's the reverse. Oh, I, only ha- I only have 10. Do you research and they have 1,000? You're like, what? I don't, where do I even begin with you? Implement, implement the controls. Again, don't just do this framework and be like, hoo-hoo, I'm done with security, and you walk away, but you never implement any of the controls you just did. And like, I don't, why are we on the opposite end of this now? Actively administer and manage your site. Come up with basic cycles. Once a week, once a quarter, once a month, whatever it is that you require as an organization. And just go back and check. The worst thing is to have a logs and activity and be monitoring everything, but then never really monitor it. Everybody tracks all these logs, but nobody ever looks at it. <laughs> Like, so why are you tracking the logs, right? Revisit the process continuously in some cycle, whatever that may be. And when it comes down to, this is what it looks like. Nice and basic, right? And then if you want to dive into specific controls and all that stuff, that's great. That's a conversation for another day, and we can go hours on that, right? But we can't even begin to have those conversations until we've started this conversation, You cannot start looking at solutions like mine or any of my competitors or anything like that until you have a basic understanding of security. If not, you're just wasting your time. And so with that, my name is Tony. I apologize if I yelled at you too much. I apologize if I cursed too much. Uh, But I go by Perez Box online, uh, and I'm open to any questions. Kind of. (laughs) Okay. Uh, Yeah, sure. Uh, first off, thanks for the talk. This is great. Sure. Um, and second, uh, you talked about uh, people being essentially the weakest link. Yeah. Uh, and one listening. of the problems one of the problems I've had is uh, people, as you try to tighten the controls on them, uh, they have that friction, and then they find other ways that are, in sen- some sense, worse. The two examples you gave were the not letting users set their password. Well, then they email their password to themselves. Or like s- using a whitelist, well, then they travel and they don't tell IT that they're traveling and they come and, you know, and then you find out, you overhear them calling someone on the phone, giving them their password over the phone so they can log in from the office uh, because, you know, they didn't bother yeah. uh, getting that taken care of. Is there, do you have any sort of broad strategies or even specific things for dealing with preventing people from having worse strategies or even measuring, measuring, uh, if those behavior changes are causing more harm, or are, you know. Well, uh, the, the thing, the, the, the hardest thing of that question is it's, this is a behavior problem, right? Um, I'm not a psychologist, so it's very difficult for me to talk to that specifically. Um, and so, but what we like to think though is, <laughs> at least what we do is, when we implement our controls, we like to be just as sneaky and be like, well, how are they going to break this, <laughs> right? And it's not about making it harder, but it's about educating them, right? Um, but it's, it's hard. Like if, if somebody travels and they don't tell you they're traveling and they call their guy and the guy gives them their passwords, I, I like to believe that through, through awareness and education and by empowering the individuals with knowledge, they're going to make the right decisions. In some instances, there's only so much we can do, right? Um, and so they're going to do that. And, and it's going to be a tough one. I, I don't have a good answer for that, unfortunately. Um, if, if a user doesn't want to comply, they're not going to comply, and they're always going to find a workaround. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm open to anybody recommendations or thoughts on things that other people have done. You just really got to have management yeah. look at them and say, look, you need to comply. Yeah. Well, and that's exactly right. It's, it's, it's really a management decision. The management yeah. has to say, look, this is what we're doing. Yeah. If you don't do it, you're gone. Yeah, it's... it's it's a good point, right? Security um, has to come from the top down, right? It can't go from, the, from down up. It'll never, it'll, it'll never work. So if your leadership isn't bought into the things that you're trying to do, it'll be very difficult for you to implement anything. So the best thing, unfortunately, is um, if leadership is bought in and you're going to buckle down on it and somebody does it, some form of reprimand, termination, or something like that, watch how fast everybody gets in line. They're like, oh, they're not messing around. The more they, it's like your kids, right? You tell them no, they do it again. You tell them no, you never, you never do anything. You never punish them. They'll just keep doing it. You just keep telling them no. <laughs> and then you take that iPhone away, like, yeah, what's up now? <laughs> Go on their Minecraft, destroy their city, and see what's up, right? Yeah, and what? I know. I, I'm just saying. Sure. Yeah, yeah. 
Yes, ma'am. Yes. It is. Absolutely. It's not about, we have a very bad habit of saying no, because you're just so overwhelmed. It's like us when we work with our customers, you get the same question every day. It's like, how many times you can ask me this question? Little do you know that it's actually a new guy asking you the question every time, right? Um, but you just deal with it every time. So as professionals, we have to be like, okay, let's understand what's going on through their mind and their experience. It kind of, sometimes it can suck, but to his point, there's always a softer approach and we need to break this barrier of, oh, if I just go to IT, they'll say no, because that's when they come up with other solutions. But if we become part of the problem solving what are you trying to do? Okay, okay, using my secure by default approach, how can I achieve that for you? How can I help you do what you're trying to do? That's all they want to do is do their job. How do we make it easier for them while still complying with this concept? It, it almost sounds like uh, there's like in the cycle of implementation and, yeah. and review, there's almost a cycle, that a, a portion that needs to include education or communication. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks for listening. You remember that thing I said a couple slides ago. What do you see the future for like, you know, there's all these zombie nets out there that are attacking your sites and doing bad things. All of the things you're talking about are internal reactive things. You yeah. know, what's the future for being able to reach out and, you know, report the sites that are doing bad things so that you can be proactive and try to shut down? Well, there's a lot of groups doing that now, right? Um, you know, IoT is a big thing now, right? Everybody loves that phrase. Right, uh, and you know, I think we have IoT providers coming online by the minute. <laughs> um, there are a lot of organizations that work um, with other organizations, sharing information, a lot of intelligence sharing, trying to shut down these things. I think that as an organization, it's very difficult for you to mitigate that yourselves. That's going to be done at a broader level, I think. Um, at, at a broader security level. I don't think that at an organization level you're gonna be able to. Um, I think that that's gonna continue. We, we have this huge issue with all these devices coming online. I mean, we have refrigerators with access to the internet. I don't know why. Um, that's, it, that's exactly right. We, we have to have everything can, very, very convenient, right? Um, when I'm in the bathroom, I need to know if my toaster is about to come up or not, right? Um, <laughs> And so it's a very big challenge, and, and, and we've started to see regulatory bodies get involved now, right? And I, I anticipate that that'll continue. There's going to be more regulation. There's a lot of lobbying in place to implement stronger controls, security controls at the, um, in, uh, at the, at the service providers themselves, right? At, at the product developers, right? Um, you know, the default configurations for Telnet configuration active by default or default passwords that never get changed that nobody can change, right? Some of those behaviors are going to change, but it's going to change um, higher up in the supply chain, right? Um, as an organization, I, I, I don't know what the future is there. Um, it would be great if we had some kind of consortium of sorts that allowed organizations to feed information in so that people can take better action against. Think of like a, a Let's Encrypt-like consortium that allows us to pursue organizations and, and, and bring down the hammer. Th that would be really cool, I think, in, in, in streamlining that communication, but I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if that helps or not. I said a lot of I don't knows in that one. Um, just to know more on the password issue, and, and don't tell me to have management crack down because management and my organization are the worst offenders and if they I ask know. you for to email their password, you know, you got to do it. So, but just, uh, I, I know everybody in, in my tech department uses password managers from really bulletproof ones to the, yeah. you know, web browser integrated ones. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if anyone has any experience using, is there any kind of shared password management, you know, password manager where you can manage and, and pass those along so that, you know, sort of novices can handle that stuff. I mean, that would be well, ideal I, to me if you could. The one that I use the most um, and that a lot of organizations have, have been implementing has been very successful has been LastPass, right? Um, you, you talk to some security guys, like, oh, but they've been compromised. And I'm like, well, that's actually a good thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? The fact they've been compromised is awesome. Um, 
But so last can you pass, act as an administrator and pass? No, so pass I don't know. I don't know what their enterprise solutions look like in yeah. terms of you can do some kind of deployment internally and manage that for your users. I just know that it's a very popular and, and active solution. I don't know what other large organizations are deploying internally for their password management. Any yeah, if there were an enterprise solution like that, I'll be interested. Say again. Secret server. Is Secret server. Is Oh, nice, nice. And then, of course, you know, it's not just about the passwords, right? We need to be looking at multi-factor authentication, um, you know, because we know that the behavior problems are there. We know that no matter what we deploy, uh, they're not going to always generate the random generated passwords. So let's, let, we need to be deploying some kind of uh, multi-factor solution, um, whether it's something like Okta or some form of identity access management. <laughs> I went back to that. But, yeah, something like that within your stack that allows you to control how people are logging in. Yeah, right, you can share your passwords, but they can't actually see the password itself, which is really, really nice. I just don't know if at the enterprise level you can do like um, multi-tenancy where you can share with multiple users. You have 100 users and each user gets an account. I, I don't know, you'd have to look into that, but I know LastPass is, is very popular. I know the company that I was working for that used that. Oh, nice. Did that so that basically, you know, when somebody left, all you had to do was remove Shut it down, that's exactly right, that's exactly right. You have to change passwords because that's right. only the managers have passwords. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, the presentation seems a bit focused towards organizations like internal IT folks who are managing security. I mean, as a ve services vendor who supports a lot of clients on, on quarterly retainers, uh, and some of these are basically cover security patching for the smaller ones, and uh, not really having a whole lot of opportunities to, or, or power to enforce an internal secu IT security policy. I'm wondering how you might alter your, your message for uh, that type of Well, audience. it's interesting because um, the presentation isn't designed just for large organizations. A lot of the concepts and principles that I, I talk to here are some of the things that I, I deploy for myself on my own personal website, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think you're approaching it more from an agency. What do I do for an organization where I, I've been hired to deploy uh, or build and deploy a product for them, but they themselves don't account for security, right? Um, I think that's where you're going. I think that the message is still exactly the same. Uh, what changes is that your responsibility in that chain changes. So it's not no longer about the technical aspects of it and the management of the site, but now you become the educator, right? And that's why I was saying is that a community, we have to come together. These are the principles that we understand, but it's on us to educate our, the business um, users that are, are hiring us to do the products for them, right? So as an agency, when you're having this discussion, a classic example is... Um, we'll, we'll, we'll go through this discovery phase, the design phase, the development, the deployment phase, right? But then nowhere in that process do we ever talk security. When do we talk security? With features. Oh, that'd be awesome, right? But in many instances, a lot of agencies don't. What I like to encourage is change the conversation and introduce security early in the conversation. We're going to build this awesome thing. We're going to make a shitload of money. You're going to freaking be number one on Google. And we're going to talk about security too. Awesome. Bring that conversation up early so that at the end, when you're done with that um, performance period, whether it's a month, six months, a year, security isn't a thing that just comes up out of nowhere. But it's something that you've been continuously having this conversation on. Well, what, what should I be worried about security? I'm so glad you asked. We need to be thinking a more security by default approach. And we're going to start with access control. We know, you, we know you're going to have two main problems. You're going to have vulnerability exploitation issues. You're going to have brute force attacks against um, um, your access control mechanisms. So let's talk about that. And so you take the same concepts that you, you just heard and you use it for yourself in your presentation when you're talking about it. And shit, add a little line item in there. You know, line item, 5%, talk about security. Right? But that's, that's where that conversation needs to start. So this doesn't change. It's how you participate in that communication that changes. How do you take this information and make it part of your pitch and your communication with your customer through each of those phases, discovery, design, development, deployment? That'd be my recommendation. Agree. Day zero. It, it, it has to be a mindset. Hi. Um, great talk. So thank you. Um, just uh, out of curiosity, I think there's kind of like a widely held belief that, you know, if you follow best practices and you put your security controls in place, you know, following industry standards for securing an application or a website, that 
if you do that, that hackers will bypass your site or your application and go for easier pickings. Has it been your experience that that's true? Oh yeah, if you look at, um, in my last talk, I talked to the anatomy of attacks, I talked to the psychology of attackers, things like that. I didn't get into this just because I, I tried to break it up a little bit, but uh, if you look at how attacks are happening today, right? unless you're a really large organization, you're not dealing with targeted attacks. You're dealing with 99% of them are automated, it's low hanging fruit. The basic things that you do around here on the controls that I just discussed, people don't realize how beneficial that is for you. You, lo you lower your risk posture when they're scanning their sites. I mean, we're not talking very sophisticated cyber criminals. In this day and age, with the way that things are, the way the number of technologies that have gone online, we're dealing with a lot more script kitties that are just really good script kitties that understand how to use these tools. Oh, I can do some Google Dork scripts and identify all the sites that are using Drupal 6 or all the sites that are using Joomla 1.5, and that goes into another list. Okay, then I'll scan them for whatever extensions and modules they may have. Okay, and then it goes to another list, and another list, and another list. And by the time it gets to the final list, they have this final list, they press a button, and it just does all the automation. Right? It, it's not sophisticated, it's not complex, but it's effective. It's effective because as humans, we have bad behaviors. So yes, I, I believe in that. I believe that with knowing that 99.9% .9 of the websites and the attacks that are occurring are automated and they're being done by script kiddies and you know, there isn't any targeted mechanism to it, by doing some of these things, you reduce your exposure, which provides a more secure environment for you. I work for a, a nonprofit um, media and research company that due to the nature of its content is the target of uh, state-sponsored hackers. Sure. Countries like Russia and sure. China, and they, we, they, a have, lot of that. they have wiped out our intranets and our websites <clears throat> in the past, and we, we currently get attacks from them all, all the time. What's like the best approach to, to handle attacking with, with, with that kind of resources behind them? Well, it depends, right? What are the kind of attacks you're dealing with, right? Is it, are they external attacks specifically to your website, or are they attacks against your... Um, Every, your employees, know. where they're doing phishing attacks, trying to get access, things like that, right? Because you handle each of them very differently. So if they're the websites type stuff, there's a lot of those attacks that can be mitigated at the edge, at the cloud, right? Um, whether they're doing denial of service attacks, whether they're doing exploitation attempts, um, whether they're doing brute force attacks, a lot of that stuff can happen at the cloud, right? Um, at the edge, and then that complements your team. If you have an organization like that, I normally recommend you partner with an organization that can work with you on your security controls unless you have your own security team internally. The problem is that many organizations that suffer this don't have their security team. They, let on, they don't even have an IT team, let alone a security team, right? So it's about partnering with someone that can help guide you through that process and you put a plan together. Like, okay, what are the big things that they're doing to us? Okay, well, let's, let's address those. How are we gonna address those? It's difficult to knock all of them off right now without understanding more details, but I would look at cloud-based solutions and I would look at partnering with someone that can help you put a plan in place for that. Um, without knowing any specifics, right? Things like phishing though, things like phishing, if that's what they're doing, um, trying to get users' credentials, trying to trick people to share their information so that they can get access to your environment, that's an awareness issue, right? That's a fundamentally different security problem um, that would require more engagement internally. Um, I don't know what other attacks you're dealing with though, um, but that usually covers a, the wide range of them. Is there something in there that I didn't address? Well, I mean, we, we do engage with a um, security technology company, that, and we do have our own security officer and such. But, okay. And, and I'm, the, I'm the DevOps engineer for the organization, so I'm, I'm just looking to, as a way to, to audit what those guys are doing, and, and they're, oh, they're to in audit. the areas of responsibility, because when something does happen, you know, I'm the one that gets the phone call to like, yeah, hey, I, our stuff is. is I'm not down. familiar with any, um, auditing services or solutions that would go and essentially verify what your teams are doing right now and if they're being effective and if they're matching what your expectations are? Because any, the, uh, the other dark spot is when something does happen, you know, everybody keeps that to themselves. Security officer says, he won't tell me how they, they got into our stuff. And then the, you know, the security people, they're, they're also sensitive about revealing, you know, they look bad because of Yeah, that. everybody's worried about CYA, right? Like, oh my God, if somebody sees that I did something wrong, but that's a culture issue, right? If people are, are afraid of sharing information because they're afraid of, of a reprimand or something coming down on them, that's a fundamentally different problem, right? You need to change that culture to be more inclusive and more open so people can share that information and they're not, they're not worried about uh, a negative response from leadership. Um, again, that's a, that's a much larger conversation. I, I would encourage you to change that culture 
because you need that information to flow internally, especially if it's an internal. It's not like you're going to get fired for this, but it's how are we going to learn from this? This is why we need to have this information. If I don't understand how it happened and where our controls failed, how will we ensure that it doesn't happen again? And if you approach them like that, most reasonable people will be like, all right, no problem. And then they tell you, and then you fire them. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. All right, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Oh, White Hat, yeah. Yeah, and I'm wondering if that's just... Well, White Hat, um, I know Jeremiah, I know his company um, before he left, but um, uh, they're a great company, and I've always known them to be more from a uh, vulnerability standpoint. They do, they do research to identify any vulnerabilities in your applications, things like that. I don't know if they do the kind of audits that he's describing, because what he's describing is more, I want an audit what my teams are doing to see if they're doing what they said they're doing, and are we, are we mitigating our risks? I don't think they do that. But you can contact them. Yeah. That's what you're looking for, right? I want to have a confidence level that, yeah. you know, our organization, you know, they have their butts covered despite yeah. the yeah. politically sensitive nature of the organization. Yeah. And sometimes having an unbiased party helps. Like, they just come in, they assess it. This is, where, this is their areas. Yeah, transparency is critical, right? If you don't have transparency, I, I don't even know how to begin to solve that problem. And that's what I'm saying. You have to solve that culture problem because you need people to share what happened. If you don't know, then you can't go back into the process. If you, if you don't know what's happening, and maybe that's a conversation you need to have. Maybe you need to sit down with the people that are responsible and be like, listen, guys, let's put all our, our personal biases aside and, and let me explain to you why this is such an important thing for our organization. Right? Um, we, we need to understand. If we don't understand, how can we ensure that we're mitigating this in the future? And put, put that question to them. Questions? Yes, ma'am. Ransomware, is, it's a really big problem. It's actually a problem with websites as much as it is at the endpoints. But at the websites, it's a little easier to, to, to mitigate. At the endpoints, the, the easiest solution right there is backups. There really is nothing, there's nothing, at least in my opinion, um, no fancy solution that's going to help you mitigate that, right? Unless you have cyber computers in about 240 years. Backups. Implementing some mechanism that allows you to do backups in some frequency, whether that's daily, weekly, depending on the, the no, sensitivity. It. That's, why, uh, that's we, we, we it. That it does. It does. Yeah, no, I um, I don't have a good solution for that. Yeah. 
I, I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily call them white hackers, right? It'd be more on the gray side. But um, yeah, there's a lot of that too. <laughs> Quick question. Yes, sir. Well, one, one point of clarity is, um, I didn't say checklists are a bad thing. I said um, they're good in terms of uh, providing us a foundation. A checklist mentality is a bad thing, right? Um, if we approach it as, I do X, Y, and Z, and that's it, then that's bad. If we to approach it from security, but then use a security checklist to help guide us through this process, very similar to what PCI does, like, hey, these are the things you should be thinking about, that is a good thing. But if you keep that mindset in place, right? Um, but there are actually a, a number of frameworks out there. I, I don't know, um, what kind of organization are you? Um, it's a non-profit, similar to the Gershwin getting hacked from all over the world. Gotcha, 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 gotcha. Um, I, I don't know what everyone else uses, right? I, I would encourage you to look at that NIST security framework for critical infrastructure. It's a very basic one, um, and I think it's a very good place to start. And it can provide you a checklist. The difference is that it's going to be your checklist. You will create a checklist based on your organization's requirements. Um, and, and what might be helpful is my, my usual approach for frameworks is what, is what are the other organizations doing? Like what does PCI do? What does HIPAA do? What does FISMA do, right? And then I create my own. What applies to me? Because if you take what everyone does and try to pigeonhole yourself into it, you'll find yourself like, oh, I'm not thinking about this. Like, well, yeah, but what should you be thinking about that? Does it really matter? Right? So maybe look at PCI. PCI actually does a really good job. Take away the card data piece of it and think, okay, well, if I'm not thinking card data and I'm thinking my infrastructure, how does that apply? And you'll start seeing there's a lot of similarities. Oh, okay, let me use this piece for that. Let me use this piece for that. Maybe marry the NIST and the PCI components together just to give you a high level understanding of what you should be thinking about. That would be a recommendation. I'm here for you. Yes, ma'am. We have a lot of not creating accounts on the website. Which capture are you using? Are you using the Google capture or are you using one of the modules? Mm. Do you, um, you leave the registration open to everyone because anybody can register your? Yeah. Mm, that's always a tough one. That's always a tough one. You know, you know what the captures I like are the logic ones. What is seven plus one, right? Um, yeah, right, stuff like that. Things that have some form of logic that requires a user to think, it's a lot harder for the bots to automate that, especially if it's always randomized versus the, even the picture selections. They're getting smarter and smarter. Um, I would look at that. But it, if you have to have it open to the world and that's part of your position, that's going to be a tough one. Oh, okay. That's, that's cool. That's cool. So they put all these hidden fields, and then, uh, yeah, so the bots will pick them up immediately because they're just looking at that, and they're like, wait a minute, that's obviously wrong. That's cool, yeah. Yeah, do not worry about round tracing requiring email authentication as well. True. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. 